Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Ascendus Masterminds for Managers webinar. I'm Lauren Young of Freshly Baked Communications, and today I'll be moderating a webinar that is part of a series of interactive experiences with a trusted industry expert on the topic of decision making. This expert was carefully selected to provide innovative insights and improve organizational productivity and make better decision making, which should help you result in significant growth. Our topic is avoiding the high cost of bad decisions, and Cassandra O'Neill, CEO of Wholeonomy, will lead our discussion this morning. Welcome, Cassandra. Thank you. Welcome. So thanks, everyone. If you've joined this Masterminds for Managers series of webinars before, you're aware that these are brought to you by the Chicago-based firm Ascendus Learning Connection, which was founded by learning management expert Sue Drake. Our goal is to provide you with timely presentations that can be expanded into customized learning modules for your organization. And in turn, we hope that you can use this information to build supplemental partnerships for your organization and to generate new growth and progress. The Mastermind for Managers webinar series gives you the opportunity to do three things. First, to meet a subject matter expert who can potentially help you solve a business challenge that is currently facing your organization. Two, to experience firsthand a possible solution for your organization, so you have the opportunity to test the waters before recommending this option internally to your higher-ups. And finally, you can see this expert in action to ensure that he or she is a good fit for your organization in terms of style, personality, and approach. So just a few housekeeping rules. Before we begin, please keep your phones on mute to eliminate background noise during the conference. You will have an opportunity to ask questions with our expert at the end of the webinar. In the meantime, if you do have any questions or would like to submit additional comments to Cassandra or I during the presentation, you're welcome to participate by using the chat feature on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. There will also be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar where Cassandra will be happy to answer as many questions as she can during our allotted time. All right. So hopefully that sounds good, and I'm going to show you what's playing in today's webinar. We will start off with our challenge of the day, and then follow this up by our famous Test the Water segment. This allows you to test drive a sample consulting engagement with Cassandra. And then finally, we'll wrap up today's presentation with the What's the Buzz segment. And we'd love to get your feedback and answer any questions that you may have. One more thing, we do have this special game that we play throughout the webinar just to make sure that we're keeping the mood very light and interactive, and this is called our term of the day. So during the webinar, every webinar that we've done this year, we unveil a brand new term that's related to the content that the expert is showcasing, Wheel of Fortune style as you can see here. And the first person that can submit the correct answer in the chat field will win two entries in our end of the year drawing which will happen next month for a complimentary training facilitated by one of our fabulous Ascendus experts. So don't worry if you can't guess the term yet. We will flash this slide again with more letters filled in during today's webinar. So best of luck to you. And then you're also welcome to submit any questions or comments that you have via Twitter at Drake Ascendus. Be sure to use the hashtag AscendusMM so that we can find your questions easily. So this is great for those of you that are listening only, maybe driving right now. If you can't view the live webinar, you can still stay included in our conversation. Right. So before we get started this morning, I'd like to give you some details on your host. So I serve as the CEO and founder of Freshly Baked Communications, which is a brand marketing strategy and content writing firm. Our specialty is creating memorable brand messaging across the world. And I'm also a four-time award-winning author and a recent recipient of the Daily Herald Entrepreneurial Excellence Award. So Cassandra, it's time for me to interview you. I usually get a lot of interest in how I came up with the name of my business, but I'm very, very interested in learning a little bit more about yours. So how did you come up with the name for your business, Holonomy? Well, thank you so much for asking that. Um, actually, holon is a physics term, and it means part. And so holonomy is about the idea that everyone is both autonomous and a member of a larger whole or team. So I really thought it was reflecting the work that I do. 
I like it. Sounds good. One more question before we begin. So I know that you've built your business on showing executives how to make great decisions. So can you tell us all what's the great or the best decision you've ever made? Yeah, this is a great question. I, I really enjoyed thinking about what I was going to, how I was going to answer it. And, and what I landed on was about 10 years ago, I had found out about some different kinds of professional development opportunities, learning, coaching skills, and facilitation skills. And I really invested in that, and it was completely um, transformative, for lack of a better word, in terms of, of setting a new, a new path for my work and being able to bring a much higher skill set to my work with organizations and individuals. So I have to say that that was definitely one of my best decisions. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. All right, everyone. So as Cassandra begins, I'd like to let you know that she has a special giveaway for you at the end of this presentation for being a part of it today. So be sure to pay close attention to the information she's about to share. Take it away, Cassandra. Okay, thank you. So the challenge of the day is to really think about how we can all avoid the high cost of bad decisions. And we're going to start with a few poll questions to get you engaged with the topic, thinking right away, and that will really frame the rest of the session. So the first question is whether it, so you're, I'm going to read a statement and then ask you to vote whether you think it's fact or fiction. So the statement is, in 1977, 20th Century Fox executives signed overall product merchandising rights for any and all Star Wars films to George, George Lucas for a $20,000 cut in Lucas's paycheck. Do you think that is fact, A, or fiction, B? All right. So everyone feel free to jump in and vote. Oh my goodness, the responses are coming in very quickly. I'll give you about five more seconds to make a decision. Three, two, one. Okay, we're going to go over to the results. Cassandra, what do you see? I see, I don't see the percent, but I see 10 people said fact and five said fiction. Oh, should I see? press skip to the results? 66%. Yeah, 66% are saying fact and about one okay. third are saying fiction, yes. Okay, so it is, in, it is true, in fact. So as you can see, that was a very good decision for George Lucas and pretty bad one for 20th Century Fox. So the next one, the next question. In 1962, the executive in charge of talent at Decca Records rejected the Beatles because they sounded too much like the Shadows and four-piece groups with guitars were on the way out anyway. If you think that is true, Click A for fact and B for fiction if you think it's not true. All right, everyone's jumping in. Okay, three more seconds. Two, one. Okay, going over to the results. And 93% of you said fact, and that is in fact true. And then right now the Beatles have sold over 2 billion albums worldwide. So again, not a very good decision from DECA Records executives. Wow. <laughs> One more poll question. How many publishing firms rejected J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, and the Sorcerer's Stone? If you think it was 12, it's A, 7, B, 10, C, or 1, D? All right. Three, two, one. All right, I'll close the poll. Okay, so 53% of you said 12, and that is the correct answer. So once again, that was maybe not a good decision for those 12 publishing firms. But you, you know, these decisions look so obviously terrible in retrospect, but at the time, it's really not clear. And I think that's the point that is so important in thinking about the rest of the session, about the traps that we fall into when we're making decisions and how we can avoid them. So we're going to learn some things, and it may require unlearning and relearning, and that is really hard. It is much harder to unlearn something that you thought was true that, in fact, isn't than it is to learn something without having any preconceived ideas. 
So if you, you might feel a little bit of disagreement with some of this material, and, and that's fine. I just encourage you to just be open. And most of this um, is coming from a couple of different books. The Decisive is by Jan, uh, Chip and Dan Heath, and they have written some great books, including Switch, about change. And they basically take a lot of research and put it together in a way that's very accessible and easy for people to understand. So we're going to go over the four, co four cognitive traps in decision making that are most common. And we're going to learn a four-step process to stay out of these traps. At the end, we're going to review a decision making matrix. And of course, we're always going to have fun. It's always a learning goal. All right. So everyone take a look at your screen one more time. We have filled in a few more letters for our term of the day. So if you think you know the answer, oh my goodness, I think we have a winner. That was very fast. Congratulations, Ryan, you are the first person to put in the correct term of the day. If you're not certain on what it is, I will unveil it for you right now. The answer was decision trap. Very good. So I think, Ryan, I think you win the war for the speediest person in 2015 <laughs> to come up with the word. So everybody else, thank you very much for submitting the correct answer. Um, we're going to go back to the test the water segment now. This is where you'll have the opportunity to test drive what Cassandra does on a sample um, engagement. So I'll turn it back over to Cassandra. Well, two other people got it too. <laughs> yeah, very quick. This is great. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go over these four common cognitive traps that affect decision making. And I'm really going to ask you to think about what solutions are. And at the end of this segment, I'll give you an opportunity to type some in. Although, if you think of them on the way, feel free to type them in. After that, I'm going to go over that four step process and talk about solutions. But before we get there, we'd love to hear what people are thinking. I know some of the people on here, I know you're very skilled at this. Okay, so one more poll question about the specific cognitive trap I'm going to talk about first, and I'll give you a hint. It is called narrow framing. So here's the question. How much money did Quaker lose in the three years after the company bought Snapple? If you think it's $5 million, it's A, $1 billion, B, $1.5 billion, C, or $100 million, D. All right. Responses are coming in quickly. I'll give everybody about five more seconds to make a decision. Three, two, one. Okay, let's go to the results. Okay, this is funny to me because five million got the most votes, and I don't know if that's because it's first. You know, when we make decisions about what to answer on a question, <laughs> I think that might influence it. But the actual <laughs> answer is 1.5 billion. It's 16.7% uh, of you got that right. That is an enormous amount of money to lose. It's not spend, it's lose. And so one of the things that is a, a result of the narrow framing that they in fact used when they thought about it is should we buy this yes or no. They really didn't consider any other options about how to invest that money. And if you ask the question, how should we invest or how could we invest $1.5 billion, I think you could come up with a lot better ideas than actually just losing it. So while this question about buying a company or not might be, not be part of your daily work, we are all faced with decisions on a daily basis that we have this kind of narrow framing. So typically um, around hiring or firing, the questions are framed as, should I fire this person, yes or no? Should I hire this person, yes or no? And not really looking at some kinds of other options. So we're going to move on to our second cognitive trap. So this question is related to it. And I'll give you a hint. It's called confirmation bias. So if you're hiring someone and you think they're going to be a great fit, you check their references, you think you've done your research, is there anything else you do before making the offer? Sleep on it, yeah. Okay. So feel free to write your response in the chat field. It's at the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Looks like we're getting a couple of responses right now. So Nicole is saying sleep on it. Do you agree that sleeping on um, anything when you're making a major decision is helpful? Does it help cloud your thoughts at all? 
I think it is very helpful and it definitely ties in with one of the solutions that we're going to get to at that section. Okay. Um, let's see. Jen says, research the person's online profile. So LinkedIn, definitely. Can you think of any other places to go to, Cassandra? Um, well, you know, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting because if you people, some of you may have been through this exact process where you've done this and you thought this was a good fit and the person started working and, it, and if it wasn't a good fit, it's really because of this confirmation bias, which means, and we're all victim to it, it's like just part of our brains. It's not like there's anything wrong. You know, it's just kind of how we are as, as humans that we search out information to convince ourselves that we're right. And so even if you do references, even if you do those kinds of things, if your lens is only looking for things that confirm that you think it's a good decision, that's all you'll see. So this is really tricky um, to get over, but knowing about it is a really important thing because then you can put in place some things, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we're going to go to the next cognitive trap, number three. This one is a poll. It's a little bit too, it's a two-part, so I'm just going to go through it and then we can see what people think. Okay, so college students were given the following scenario. Would you rather have job A, a high-paying job that aligns with what they studied and is kind of what they think they should do, or job B, a non-traditional career that pays less but is more fulfilling? So when they were asked themselves which job they would choose, 66% said B. Now then they were asked the second question, and here's what the poll is. They were asked, if this was your best friend, what job would you advise them to choose? So what do you think? What percent said that they would recommend their best friend choose job B? A, 50%, B, 100%, C, 83%, or D, 66%? Okay. So we're going to go to the next slide where you can actually vote on the question. I see a lot of people putting their answers in the poll. So go ahead here. All right, I'll give you about four more seconds, three, two, one. Okay, let's close the poll and look at the results. Okay, so the you guys got it right. The 37% said 83%, and that is exactly what happened. So I'm going to get, again, this gets back to kind of the issues that you were talking about. If you sleep on it, you get a little bit of different perspective. And if you put yourself in your shoe, you take yourself out of this question and put your best friend in the equation, you actually get a different answer than if you were thinking about yourself. So this is the short-term emotion that can get in the way. And this is cognitive trap three. So later on, there's a quick question that you can ask to help you overcome this, which is great news. And um, I will get to that very soon. We're going to move on to the fourth cognitive trap, and there's a poll about that one. So again, it's overconfidence. i give you a little hint. So a study showed that when doctors reckoned that they were completely certain about a diagnosis, what percent of the time were they actually wrong? So again, they think they're completely certain about the diagnosis. So if you think it was A, they're wrong 10% of the time, B, 20% of the time, C, 30% of the time, or D, 40% of the time. Okay, results are coming in. I'm going to close the poll in three seconds. Two, one. All right, let's see the results. Okay, you guys oh, got a tie for the right answer. So the right answer is 40% of the time. That is pretty scary. I mean, this is doctors that said they were like 100% certain that they were right and they were wrong 40% of the time. So again, we all fall victim to this overconfidence. I put this slide in with the skateboarder because I thought, you know, we just think, yeah, we can do it. We're right. And it's, it's really our brain playing tricks on us sometimes because we don't like to feel uncertain or we don't like to feel that we don't know. Okay, so now is a chance for people to check in or contribute some ideas about that you have about um, how to overcome these decision-making traps. 
And there were a couple people that answered earlier that I say, I'll say um, are good ones, talking with people's colleagues, not just their listed references. And trying them out to see if they're a good fit is a great idea. That's why that attempt to hire process is becoming so popular because that does give people a chance to, to try out someone before making the commitment of a job offer. Sure. And I think this is why so many people have mentors or people who serve on the executive team where they can run ideas past so they don't mm -hmm. feel alone in the decision-making process. I think that really helps. It does. And the group can fall victim to the same cognitive trap. So even that's not in and of itself just enough because I've seen that where, you know, it's a group think where people all think this person is the right hire and then the person isn't when they start. So it is def it definitely can be a correction for an individual making a decision, but you have to look at the risks for the whole group. Mm -hmm. I see a couple of other great responses. Shauna is saying collaborate with others. Jen says, talk to people outside of your industry. And Sandra says, have individuals meet many levels during the interview. Yes. Yes. I, I'm listening to this book on tape that suggested when people go in for interviews, you collect information from the people that greet them and the security guard and the receptionist because that's more likely to be their true self than what they're acting like in the interview. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you everyone. Okay, so this process wrap, it's again from the Heath Brothers book. They love acronyms, so we'll go through these one by one. And these are all ways to overcome these cognitive traps. So widening your options, again, don't just consider one thing, yes or no. Teenagers are very, um, off, very often limit their decisions to this, yes or no, should I do this one thing, yes or no. And not surprisingly, organizations are also. So this is just something that you can really improve your odds of making a good decision by looking at more than one option. And then reality test your assumptions. So again, we talked about this a little bit with like the attempt to hire idea, but really to run small experiments. So there's a story in the book about a company that wanted to hire a firm to do something large. But instead of just giving it all or nothing to one firm, they chunked out the very first step and they, bid, they they hired five different firms to do that first step. This gave them a ton of good ideas as well as showing who they really wanted to work for for the rest of them. So really just t trying to make the decision not this all eggs are all in one basket, all or nothing decision. Okay, the, the next step, attain distance before deciding. So this could happen with a good night's sleep or some of the other things that people people have suggested, but I'll tell you the magic question. So if you have been agonizing over something personally, and, and you, you know, sometimes it goes on for months, the way to quickly get yourself out of that is to just imagine if it was your best friend. What would you tell your best friend? And sometimes that answer is immediate. Sometimes it's not immediate, but pretty soon. And if it's a work question, again, sometimes people know what they need to do in their job but they have emotional attachments to what was being done that, they, that hinder them. So that version of the question is, what would you tell your successor? And then it becomes very clear what to do. And then the fourth one, prepare to be wrong. Again, we don't like being wrong, so we want to just pretend that we're not going to be wrong and that we can read the future. But there's a great example about this, that you can set up these tripwires so that you don't have to worry and there's a story in the book, and I remember hearing these rumors when I, was, when I was younger. So there was a band that had a very complicated kind of electric setup for their concerts, and they had a big, big contract with an enormous amount of detail about how things needed to be set up. And they stuck right in the middle of it a thing about having a bowl of M&Ms out with no brown M&Ms. So if they got to a venue and they saw this bowl of M&Ms, and if it had brown M&Ms in it, they knew that the, they hadn't really read the contract carefully, and they knew that they needed to really go through all the setup to make sure that it was going to be safe. So again, instead of just assuming, well, they signed the contract, everything is going to be right, they put in place this little tripwire to see. That's a great story, Cassandra. I'd like to ask everybody if you can guess which band that is. I know. We don't have anything to give away, but you get bragging rights. On the yeah, if you're old enough, you'll remember. <laughs> oh, here you go, Shauna. Yep, you're correct. It was yep. Van Halen. <laughs> 
Very good. Thank you. Okay, so this question, when is intuition accurate, is is an important one because a lot of times people will say, well, I'm making this decision on my intuition or I'm making it on my gut. When is this something that is actually reliable? It's in cases that there's been a lot of repetition and feedback. So there's research about 10,000 hours is the amount that you need to be a true master at something. And it needs to be in what is called a kind environment where the cause and effect is incredibly clear. So like a golf expert or a baseball expert, when they've had this level of mastery, they can look at somebody who's starting their swing and know exactly what's going to happen before they even hit the ball. So if you have that 10,000 hours in something that is that cause and effect, that clearly cause and effect, you can pretty much rely on that. But if your experience and feedback is in what's called a wicked environment, where there's just so many variables, then it's not really going to be something that you can rely on. And I think this is really um, tricky for people because they think that they've done things a lot, they have these skills, and therefore that means that the feeling that they're getting is in fact based on this knowing, but it actually might not be. It might be like a feeling of something else. You know, like in hiring, it's often people that are similar to you. You feel good about them. So again, to just look at, you know, what, what is that information? What, what, what's the source of the information that if you're feeling like something is um, a good idea or not? So we have one more poll. So capping up this whole discussion, according to researchers, which is most important in producing decisions that increase revenues, profits, and market share, basically that are good, that have a good outcome. These words might not be exactly the kinds of decisions that you're making every day, but but good decisions that are documented by research. So they did, I mean, this comes from research about decisions and the effects, the outcomes of them. So which do you think? Is it process or analysis? Okay, like everyone's putting their votes in now, I'll give you about three more seconds. Two, one. Okay, let's close the poll and look at the results. Okay, so again, the group's right, 56% said process, and that is the answer by a factor of six. Not that analysis isn't necessary, it's often part of a good process, but analysis on its own is not enough to lead to a good decision. So just because we understand our shortcomings, it's not enough to fix them. Like if we know we're nearsighted, but we don't have glasses, we still can't see. So that's really what the importance of this kind of wrap process is, that putting in place a process that will you know, get you a much higher likelihood of a, of a good outcome. So there are many tools to help decision making, and you're going to get emails, uh, one, you're going to get a blank copy and then a handout about it. And it's a simple decision making matrix that is very helpful for groups. So if you have a group that's making decisions, it's often not clear who's making it or who's informing it. So this can be helpful by first identifying the decisions that are being made and then choosing the ones that are important to clarify the roles in relationship to the decision. And then you can actually identify the individuals or group teams in each of the decisions, and then who is responsible, who gets to approve or veto, who gets to, who needs to put input in because they have critical information, who needs just to be informed afterwards or needs to be informed when it's time to support it. So this is a very quick summary of this tool, and you know, if you look at it and you have questions, you know, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to talk to you about it. But we've been using this with a lot of groups, this wrap process and this decision-making matrix. I mean, this topic of decision-making and shared decision-making, it comes up almost every group that we work with. So I have two quotes to end my, this portion. This one, I'll read it. Sometimes the hardest part of making a good decision in no, is knowing there's one to be made. And research shows that teachers make 600 to 1,000 decisions a day, which is enormous. And so while we may not make that many, we are making a lot more than we realize. And I just found this other quote this morning I thought would be perfect. So I'm going to read it. It's from Peter Drucker. The only thing we know about the future is that it will be different. 
Trying to predict the future is like trying to drive down a country road at night with no lights while looking out the back window. This, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so when I read that, I thought that is a really good visual for look, taking a look at what decisions are being made in your organization. And it, it really goes against, I think, what people want to believe. People want to believe that they know things from their experience, which they do, but that it's enough to make good decisions without a process. And I just love that visual. So thought I would end there. Fantastic. Thank you, Cassandra. That was an awesome quote, and I need to get that in writing or something <laughs> as well. So I want to hear a little bit more from everyone on the call now. Um, your phones are all on mute, so you can't talk to us directly, but you can submit information in the chat field. So just share with us, what did you come away with from this webinar, other than that fantastic quote Cassandra just did? Um, if there was an example or a stat or a true-false question that made you think, pause, consider your organization, share that with us. We invite you to share these last minute thought with us, thoughts with us in the chat field just one more time. And Cassandra does have a special giveaway as I promised at the beginning of the webinar. Um, Cassandra, can you tell us a little bit more about this giveaway that you have here? Sure, so a one-on-one -on -one phone session with me to talk about whatever is most important to you in terms of following up on your leadership related to decision making or something else if it if it's something else. Great. Very gracious. Thank you very much. And so we don't even need to show this slide because <laughs> Ryan did get the correct answer. Decision trap was the term of the day. And so Ryan, your name is going to be added to our wall of fame from this year. So if any of you um, are on the call and you were the term of the day winners through 2015, here you are. We will select two names in December and we will reach out to you directly. We'll announce them in the newsletter and reach out to you directly to let you know that you were one of the winners selected and that you may take your choice of presentations from the experts that have done webinars this year. Okay. So that's a great thing. Also to learn is to grow, and the best place to start growing is with our learning community. So you can go on this website. Here's a little sample of how it looks. The Ascendus Learning Connection showcases just the best esteemed ex experts that offer these proven training methods that will help move your business forward, such as Cassandra. So get to know them, browse our case studies, contact these experts today for more information. You can see the link here below. If you're interested about learning more about today's program, you can find out more information on that site. Be sure to take um, a look at today's course title, which was Avoiding the High Cost of Bad Decisions, or just visit the Holonomy Expert page. So if you did register for this webinar in advance, you will receive a link in email with the link directly to this webinar. Okay. Also join us on LinkedIn. There is an Ascendus Masterminds for Managers group where you can meet all the fantastic people on this webinar today as well as the experts. You can ask them more pointed questions there too. All right. So let's go back to the chat. I see a number of <laughs> responses here. Let me go back up to the top. Jen says the wrap technique is great, and she does want to try that decision-making matrix. So good luck, um, Jen. You're in luck. We're going to actually give that out to everybody, correct, Cassandra? You'll be able to test that out? Correct. Okay. And, so, so, and there was a question about how it's been used. Do you want me to address that now? Please. So one of the things is that I, many, we've worked with many groups doing this, and, and it does make a difference in a number of ways. By making clear who, what people's roles are, you'll actually free people up to, to do things that they wanted to do but were afraid of. Because if people are afraid of that they may not shouldn't you know they may not be approved to do something, they probably won't do it. And so it might take a bit of a time of a, a while to start because it's new. And I mean, when we've worked it through with groups, generally the first decision does take pretty long to work through because they're, they're talking about a lot around you know, the decision, but then it's also how they operate as an organization. But once you get one kind of nailed down, the second, third, and fourth go a lot faster, and then the outcome is that people feel much, much better, because even if they were just mildly anxious, like they were still doing the thing that, they, that in fact they have approval and are wanted to do, they weren't 100% certain. So it really makes a big difference, and then 
lots of times people are asked, they think they're being asked for input into a decision, but they're actually not. But, and so they get upset when a decision's made and it wasn't what they had suggested. And, and oftentimes people think, well, we can't do anything about that because they're not the decision maker. But the reality is that if they just understood what their role was, they, they feel much better. Because nobody likes to be asked something and then feel like they're not being listened to. In fact, it's better not to ask them if you're not going to listen to them. But it, this kind of matrix makes it all clear and so that people, the understanding and the clarity, it just frees up it frees up the energy that was kind of caught in the fear or the hesitation or the resentment about previous decisions, and it just makes it so much better for everyone involved. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Looks like Ryan, Nicole, and they're saying their biggest aha was the importance of process versus analysis. So Ryan's learning about the value of the process and how it's not at all about analysis from Nicole's point of view. So that one really stood out too. See, Shauna is saying always get a second opinion. That's great. Uh, Marie says test your assumptions. That's a good one too. Don't just go with it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dominic is saying having great processes in place will also help lead to reaching your goals. Um, Jackie appreciates the idea of the four cognitive traps in decision making. Let's see. Dominic also saying it's not all about analyzing. That's true. Jackie says she appreciates the suggestion of widening your options. There are always more options to consider and ways to consider that decision. So that's great too. Um, Corey says, um, they've been trying to be more reflective in general, but especially of things that he or she is not sure of. I'm, I'm not sure, of Corey, if you're male or female. I don't want to <laughs> mess it up. Um, and it looks like you started doing some of the RAP processes on your own, like attaining distance and reality test assumptions. But the specific suggestions of what would you tell your best friend or your successor are invaluable. So she says, thank you very much, he or she. Yes. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts? Any other things that you'd like to add, Cassandra? Uh, no, I'm just really excited about everything people are taking away. For sure. This is a great webinar and a great way to close 2015. So thank you, everybody. Like I said, this is our last webinar of the year. The next ones will be scheduled for 2016, and we'll be sending out some messaging towards the end of the year about this, including the topics and who the featured experts who will be on. So if you're listening to the recording and you'd like to learn more about this information, just join the Masterminds for Managers group on LinkedIn so you can learn more about this. All right. So once again, thanks for your participation in the question and answer session. Congratulations, Ryan, on being our last term of the day winner for this year. And as I don't see any additional questions, oh wait, there's one more from Jackie. She's saying being able to reduce personal emotion tied to decision making process helps. She will use the idea of framing it around what she would tell someone else. So that's another great one. Thank you, Jackie. All right, I think we are now complete <laughs> with all of our questions. So I will wrap this final edition of Ascendus Masterminds for Managers for 2015. Cassandra and I would like to say thank you very much on behalf of the entire Ascendus team for your participation. And we did hope that you learned something new that you can share with your team and you can use these, inf these um, items to make better decisions in 2016. Thanks. Hope you have a great hop and a happy holiday season, and we'll see you on LinkedIn. Thank you.